I'm so excited to have this conversation. I know anytime we have a interaction of any kind, I'm always uplifted. You're just definitely one of those light workers, those beings of light on the planet. What did the council say? You live in truly a, just a fairy tale land. I don't know their exact words. You might be able to remember it, but um, I know that they have such a beautiful fondness and connection to you. So I just got choked up. So I'm so excited to be with you on the Desire Factor podcast. You know, I actually can feel our hearts together, Christy. I feel the, the connection with you. And there's such a wonderful community of people all over the world, all over, probably all over the universe we don't even know about. But um, sometimes there are just people who we connect with in our, our hearts and we know are part of our, our same shared mission. And I, I just feel you're one of those people. So I literally feel your energy in this moment. And those of your community, even before we begin speaking verbally. So thank you for this wonderful, energetic and physical connection. Yes. I love you so much. And you are just a brilliant human mind too. I mean, you have oh, so many wonderful books and I know that you have another one. That I'm really excited to even have you back on another time to talk about that. But I, I, I know so many times we've sat down and just had really incredible conversations about energy and about really, you know, as the council talks about mastering your own energy, but people don't know how. Like I was just talking to my Pilates instructor and I had done some uh, healing work on her, you know, here and there, different types. One time her foot hurt. She was having a hard time walking. I'm like, give me your foot. And I just did some energy work. And she's like, oh my God, it's better. Oh my God. Like freaking out. Like, what did you do? And just two weeks ago, her back, she was hunched over like an old lady. She couldn't stand up straight. She was in pain. Her, her back locked out. And I'm like, you can't instruct me. She was going to go home after me. And I go, get on, get on the Cadillac. And so I just did energy work on her and she popped up and she was like, I didn't expect that. Totally didn't expect that. So today she had something that upset her and she goes, I could feel it coming back. And she said, people say to me, well, you don't need Christy, you know, to, to do your energy healing. You could do it for yourself. And she goes, yeah, but I don't know how. Right. And I was like, that's it is that we teach and we're on the same type of mission, Dawson, to teach people how to process their own energy, to understand their own, their own energy, whether it's through the mind or through emotions or, you know, whatever we're here to help people understand that everything is vibration and how to understand that, learn it, process it, utilize it and make life better from it. Yeah. And I really recommend that people start with energy and you may go need a pill. You may need a surgery. You may need a, a spinal adjustment from a chiropractor. You may need all kinds of physical things, but start with energy because energy is right there and it's available to you. And it often does resolve things. And uh, one of the most obvious examples I've used in my books is that if you have a negative thought, if you simply have uh, a, a thought that's triggered by, by stress, immediately you start to produce cortisol and adrenaline, your two main stress hormones. And so right away, that energy of that negative thinking is leading to a physical thing. In the same way, a positive thought is leading to the immediate synthesis of positive hormones like DHEA, your main cell repair hormones. So focus on energy first. And again, you might need something else later on, but energy is the, the place to start. And I've had so many healings in my own life and so many healings around me just focusing on energy. And often you don't need that other intervention. You just use energy and then you see how quickly you shift. I know I, I used to sometimes need, need chiropractic adjustments. And there was a period of my life around the age of 30 when I had a lot of back problems and used to go to the chiropractor a lot. And then several times energy healers worked on me. And sometimes I'd literally feel my back just shift back into alignment. And so it's it's that 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 possible. And there I'm just working now on an update to a to a database of energy healing. And um, we did this database in 2014. We're now updating it with a bunch of grad students and scientists right now. And there are over a thousand studies published in peer-reviewed medical journals showing that energy healing techniques, Reiki, Qigong, acupressure, all of these techniques, literally there are over a thousand studies published in peer-reviewed medical journals showing that they affect all kinds of diseases from A, Alzheimer's disease to, I couldn't find a Z. Uh, <laughs> in, the, in, in, the, in the alphabet I could find was a V, a viral infection. So. <laughs> oh, geez. Well, I'm sure it'll come up with a Z at some point. <laughs> 
<laughs> they're always making up stuff so let the next next letter they need is a z <laughs> that's amazing it really is because you know i think that's what i appreciate you about you is there's some people that speak from energy from a spiritual side right from a divine side and then there's others that speak from the scientific side and i love talking to you because i get it i mean you're very spiritual and get the energy of that and all that but when you teach and you speak, you really do speak a lot about the science. And I love that what you said is just if one person could even understand that that negative thought that I just thought that is stressing me, that's creating disease in my body. It's creating disconnection, misalignment from that from our bodies. And but on the reverse, if you catch that thought and you shift it and then you say a positive thought, if you have a positive feeling associated with it you're changing that perspective, then a totally different set of scientific stuff that happens in the body to create more health and more well-being, alignment with who you are, right? The energy those, of it. Yeah, those thoughts are actually epigenetic. They are turning genes on, turning genes off from beyond the level of the genome. You're telling your genome which, which genes to turn on by your thoughts. I'll give you a really good recent example of that from, from research. So Alzheimer's, the Alzheimer's gene is called APOE, one of the first genes to be really thoroughly mapped because Alzheimer's is a terrible disease. And um, if you see people just, just, just basically over the course of 10, 20 years, they just lose all of their functioning. And so um, the APO gene has been well known, well understood since the 1970s. And so if you have an APO gene, and there are, there are four different flavors of it, but if you get an APO gene four from your mother and an APO gene four from your father, you're an APO gene four four. And APO gene four fours have a 90 plus percent probability of getting Alzheimer's disease. So that's, that's what we call a highly inherited genetic condition, epigene 3, 4, 70% plus chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. So if you have epigene 4, 4, epigene 3, 4, you have 70 plus percent chance of getting Alzheimer's, except that one recent study used new non-invasive scanning technology to look at the brains of people and were they getting Alzheimer's, were, were what they call these beta amyloid plaques building up in their brains. And beta amyloids, they're like sticky gooey tar. It's kind of like bubble gum in your side of your brain. And so the, the, the signals going through your, your nerve cells can't transmit themselves effectively to bumping up against this, this, gooey, this gooey stuff, these beta amyloid plaques. And so one study found that recent study used this these high resolution Im Im images of people's brains, but they're they're, they're images that you take well any time during the day. So the, this was a progression of images of people as they aged, and they found that whether they had the apogene three, apogene four, now they have the gene, but the strongest factor determining whether the gene turned on or off was negative thinking. If they were negative thinkers their apogenes turned on more and their beta amyloids wow. built up faster and the effect scaled. The more negative thinking, the higher the buildup of beta amyloids. So that's just one example of how negative thinking literally can turn genes on, on negatively. The positive side effect of, of that is that a research team at MIT looked at a brainwave that people generate when they're really integrated, when they're really feeling good. It's called gamma. It's your highest possible level of, of brain function. It's like 40 cycles per second and higher, really high frequency wave. And they found that gamma can clear those beta amyloid plaques. In one mouse study, they found that an hour of gamma cleared 50% of those beta amyloid plaques from the, the brain. So and these, 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 are the, these are the kinds of, of waves we find in meditators, monks, nuns, people who spend tens of thousands of hours of meditation, but even novices who do it will make more gamma. So either our thoughts are going to turn genes on or our thoughts are going to turn genes off. And cumulatively, over 10, 20, 30, 40 years, Christy, the effect is dramatic in terms of our disease and our lifespan. Amazing. So you could say that the council helps people go better and to go more into gamma. Uh, yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. uh, when people meditate, if they meditate effectively, if they're in tune with, with higher energies, if they're in elevated emotional and mental states, their gamma can increase sevenfold. So massive increases in gamma. And you feel so good. I mean, the, if, you, if you don't do it for any reason for your health, do it because it'll make you super, super happy. You just wake up every morning, you meditate, you feel as though the world's a fantastic place. You frame your day in this wonderful way. 
And then shit happens. I mean, you you know, you you have a, a car accident, a fender bender, there's a war, the, the war and the images of suffering really pull you off your game, make you, you feel the suffering of these people. And then you're framing your day in this positive light. So you frame your day in this positive way. You are aware of all the suffering in the world. And then you go and do your work and you do what you can to repair the world. So uh, it's, it's this powerful thing you can do and moving into those elevated mental and emotional states like the council puts you in. I mean, people just flip into this when they're there and they they just automatically are invited into this higher cadence of frequency and thought that energy is producing these powerful effects on your body and then the effects ripple out in our intentions all around us well let, let's talk about that because council talks about and this was really new is something you know i've been doing energy work for 25 years and but when the council brought in the step of of neutrality is compassion you know, when, when you see something, like you're saying, you see images of war, you see, you know, things that are going on or you hear things. I mean, there, there's so much variety that we uh, take in from our eyes, our ears, you know, what we, everything, right. We're taking everything. We have an energetic relationship with all that is surrounding us. And if we don't place these things, the, the proper music, the, you know, the, the teachers, the, the books, the, the things that we can draw energy into us, you know, that help uplift us, that help give it, even doing meditation, getting in that gamma space. If it's that those things help raise the gamma, right? And those things will help us live in a state that you live in Dawson, that I live in. I mean, you, you're one of the most happiest people I have ever met always in a good mood. Christine, your wife, just love, <laughs> love her. I mean, the two of you are, and people say that about Frederick and I too, right? It's like, you do live in happy land. Is the, I think there was something council said. It's like, you, you live where unicorns and rainbows and, you know, and yes, and, yeah, you, you really do. And, and yet you really appreciate your, you don't have these great things and then feel worried and, you know, but you're also human and have the, the tools and do your inner work to go, you know, I'm off today or this is happening, but it happens rarely because you are always in that space. It's like a, you take a blip over into frustration land or fear land or worry land, but then you go back into your happy land. Absolutely. And when your energy isn't right, you correct yourself. In fact, I did this last night. I just got back in the wee hours of this morning from a three month meditation and writing retreat. And, um, it was a long flight. We got back and we were in the airport and making our way toward the, the car to take us home. And um, uh, my wife was, I was pushing the baggage cart. She was guiding us toward where we were supposed to go. And she made a wrong turn and was going the wrong way. I can see we were going to miss the car because she was taking us and the, you know, the director said, shared rides this way and she was going this way. And I felt this little bit of irritation and edge in my voice. When I, when I talked to her, I just pointed out to her, hey, we need to go that way. So we got in the car and the, I, we sat there and I, I couldn't let it go. Instead, I, th I thought, that is not the energy I, as a husband, have toward my wife. So I apologized to her. I said, Donnie, I'm sorry. My tone of voice there was not what I wanted to be. She just started to cry and she felt so loved. And ra oh. rather than just, just skating over it, you know, you just, you, you had, you notice when your energy is off, do I want that energy to be, to be my marriage? Absolutely not. I don't want that energy in any part of my, my, my life. And so I, you, you monitor your, your words. Am I treating those I love caringly and respectfully? Am I treating everyone caringly and respectfully? Am I treating people who I who maybe who are injuring me with that same acknowledgement of their, their humanity? It's really powerful to do that. And energy, again, shifts our external material world. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I just love, thank you for using that example. That That's a beautiful um, personal example because, you know, someone might see someone like yourself that's been an author, you're a PhD, you know, and your, your accomplishments and you're a happy guy. You've just been in a meditation for three months, right? It's like, what, what can this guy worry about? <laughs> right? It's like, he, even the council says he lives in happy land over there, right? Yeah. But you still are human and you have those, but we all do. And, you know, we might have, we might be in a great mood and have someone that says something rude to us, or we might receive a phone call. And it's knowing how to get yourself back into alignment with that higher energy, with how you want what you want to bring in, right? It's like you, you might've been irritated, but you release the irritation. And then wherever you overstep, because 
Christine was feeling that way too, right? It's like, if, if you're feeling off, she's feeling off too, because there's a, always an energetic exchange between every stimulus or every, you know, right? It's like, it bounces off. Yeah, so you wanna monitor your energy and then take the energy you choose. Now things will happen that'll, um, that'll challenge you. And so usually the moment the psyche says, okay, I have this ideal, I wanna be this kind of a person, person, compassionate, understanding, loving, whatever the value might be, then immediately those parts of the psyche that say, oh, I don't wanna do that, will pop up yes. <laughs> to be examined. And then what we teach is to lovingly integrate those, those parts of the psyche. Don't get them to try and make them go, go away. Don't try to suppress them. Listen to those voices. Usually they are inner children who at some point in your early childhood got frozen, got shut out, got ignored, got hurt, and then they've just been there for the last 10, 20, 30, 50 years. <laughs> and so now they're thawing out and needing a little bit of attention. You just love those parts of you, you, you even the imperfect parts. I, I had a really um, powerful um, experience in the gym a few years years ago, and I look at men in, in the locker room as they were getting in, coming in and out, getting into the hot, uh, hot tub, and I just have little thoughts about them, just you know, little judgmental thoughts about this or, or that, and I, I realize I'm judging all the time, and then I, I thought, you know, I'm just going to look at look at each, each man walking in and just say, there's the Buddha entering the locker room. There's the Buddha entering the locker room. So mm. I had to do this. Just, just, just loving anyone who had entered the locker room, however they were. And so I did that for a while, maybe a few months. And one day I had this thought, gee, Dawson, you know, you're, you're still so critical. You're still, still so judgmental. And then I thought, no, you're the Buddha entering the locker room. I, I'm, I'm loving even the, the part of you that just is so stuck in, in this judgmental thinking. So it's powerful. You find that as you have compassion for others, you build that, it's, it's the insula, part of the brain is called the insula that handles compassion, has special neurons called von Economo neurons that fire in response to empathy and sympathy and compassion. And you fire those von Economo neurons often about other people, about animals, about other species, about all the things going on in the world. And then suddenly you discover that your tent of compassion has become so big, it includes even you. And then even your own failings, you're patient and compassionate with yourself. So that's, I love, I love that because the council says, give the compassion to yourself first, and then you can give it out. And so you're coming from it, the outside in approach, which a lot of people do. And that's how we're mostly trained to do that, right? If I give them and them and them, but it's like, then it surrounds you. And yet, right. It's like, there's, there's no wrong way of doing compassion, right? There, yeah. It's like either way you're going to get there. It's like compassion is, 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 is such a strong spiritual energetic tool that it, like the council says, it, they knew it neutralizes the energy. So if you're in worry and fear about yourself or others, having and feeling that energy of compassion, it's like soothing the fire, right? So that you can then neutralize yourself to then feel, well, now, you know, now I want to feel joy. Now I want to feel success. Now I want to feel free and get yourself moving up as Abraham Hicks says, moving up the emotional scale right? Getting up to the higher levels or um, David Hawking talked about the different vibrations yes. of, you know, of, of emotions. And it's, um, it's remarkable the work that we now can go wait, but then to even understand at a deeper level, I don't have to know, am I, am I, do I just sit there and think, am I frustrated or am I angry? Or am I disappointed? <laughs> like you don't even have to go through that. Yeah. It's just feel it and process yeah. it. Cause then that changes your state and that changes your health, your wealth, your well-being. I mean, every, your relationships, I mean, perfect example of I'm feeling this energetic, this energy being off in my relationship. Do I want that? No. And then, you know, clearing that energy. And use the word neutralize. It, it does. It, it, it just takes all the charge that we've got around these things and it neutralizes it. And then, and then that compassion spreads. And the other cool thing about compassion is that when I was writing my, my book, Bliss Brain. In Bliss Brain, I looked at the neuroscience of what stimulates the fastest possible positive neural plasticity. We know that neurons that fire together wire together. We know they wire together in networks and they fire in networks. We know these networks get bigger and stronger over time. So I asked myself, which, what does research tell us makes 
the biggest difference in neuroplasticity, the fastest, what style of meditation can you use? So is it a moving meditation? Is it a mantra meditation? Is it a, um, a breathing meditation? Which one stimulates neuroplastic, positive neuroplasticity the fastest? And the research is really clear on this point. The number one thing that stimulates positive neural growth that bulks up these these, these collections of nerve fibers quickest is compassion. If you look mm -hmm. at the compassion meditation research and all the other kinds of meditation research, the one that's, that's firing those positive circuits in your brain and making them bigger and faster, the quickest, the fastest possible meditation method is compassion. So even if you do yoga, do yoga and feel compassion. If your favorite form is Tai Chi or breathing or chanting, focus on the compassion aspect of your, your and layer compassion into your meditation. And compassion really is the single thing that'll make your brain change the best, the fastest. That is so cool. See, I love when you break it. I'm a why person. I'm like, well, why? Why does that feel like that? And why does that do that? And you like explain it so beautifully from a biochemical, scientific, like this is how the body functions, but it all starts. And I loved what you said, Dawson. It all starts with energy. Do whatever you need to do. I still, I do rolfing. I get massage. I get acupuncture. I do, I work out five days a week doing Pilates. You know, I do things for the body. I go get my, you know, I get my teeth cleaned. I mean, we do things to, you know, to maintain the body. Right. But it's like, it's always the energy first. You know, I, Sometimes people ask about diet and um, the effects of diet. Of course, diet is really important, but I, I, I joke and say, if I had a choice of eating a dirty diet or having a, a, a mind full of dirty thoughts, like you know, miserable, unpleasant thoughts, or I, I eat unpleasant food, the thoughts will kill you quite much quicker, quicker than the, the, the triple layer cheeseburger. Um, <laughs> really, I mean, the effect of thinking, like one, one longitudinal study looked at people for 30 years and looked at their... Their, their explanatory styles, how they explain the world. And they found that people who are optimists lived on average 10 years longer than pessimists. It, the difference is enormous cumulatively over time. And so the, the, your thoughts, I mean, you, you can eat the, mo the most pristine diet, take all the supplements you want, do all the stuff to support yourself physically. And if you are thinking negative thoughts, you're just I mean, the, the magnitude of the effect of negative thinking is much greater than every possible physical intervention you, you, can, you, can, you can use. Now, if you do both, if you're both doing mental hygiene and you're doing that rolfing and that Pilates and that time in nature and that clean, clean food and those supplements, if you're doing all of those things, then you're nurturing your body with all the things it needs physically and you're nurturing your mind, your mind is then producing these epigenetic effects on your body, and you are gonna live a much longer and much healthier and definitely vastly happier life than you otherwise would. So the potential, Christy, is, I mean, I'm so excited about this, this research because it's not just showing us that we get, you know, five extra days of longevity, it's showing that we get 10 extra years just by changing our minds. I mean, if that isn't wildly exciting, what is? <laughs> well, you know, not even that. It's like, yes, yes. And the quality of those years, Dawson, because yeah. it's like, oh, 10 more years of living a miserable life. Great. Right. But what if you absolutely love your life and you're just like, oh my gosh, I'm getting creative and I'm 70, I'm going to start a business. And, you know, I mean, just that kind of like wherever the wind takes you because it feels just so good. I mean, that, that kind of quality of life where you have the vitality, you have the energy, you have the mobility, the flexibility to hike if you want to go for a hike or to go on a trip or have the energy to run with your grandkids or, you know, whatever it is, that's the quality of that. So yes, the longevity, fantastic, but the quality of that life within that time, that is just is enormously better, yeah. Oh. And you know, our bodies can last a long, long, long time and be be fairly healthy. I don't believe, I mean, some people believe that we can live forever. And we, you know, Dave, Dave Asprey, my dear friend says that his goal is to live to 180. And, you know, he, Dave might live to 180, um, but however long you have, whether it's one day or whether it's hundred more years, just live that vibrant life. And every day, one of the things we find too in our research is that people who live this way 
they live fearlessly and they live without fear of death. And if they do die in the next day, if they do, if, if something does take them out in the next hour, 24 hours or, or, or year, then they've lived this, this joyful life and they have a sense of, of the passion of life. And then the chances are you'll live much, much longer. And so um, I, I really believe that when you move to the elevated states, it's voluntary. You can do it. You can choose to do it. You can make a routine of it. You can make a habit of it. You can make a choice to do it. It's, it's free. The stuff's all over the web. And then you do these things. You shift yourself. And then your life becomes dramatically better. And then that joy just expands. One of the cool things, Christy, is I, in this brain, I said to myself, you know, we, we know that these monks and these nuns are super joyful. We know they have seven times the gamma of ordinary people. They're just in, they're so blissed out. They look like people on psilocybin. I mean, really, they look like people, they look like people on drugs. They're, in fact, they, they are on drugs because they our, our, our brain produces natural psilocybin mm -hmm. when we're like this. But I said to myself, you know, these people have done 40,000 hours. I mean, surely they are still changing their brains could not still be changing at 40,000 hours and in the west if, if we're a meditator if, if you if you've done 6,000 hours that's a lot but some of these Tibetan monks have done 6,000 hours by the time they're 15 years old so uh these these meditators have done 40,000 years so I 40,000 hours of meditation so I found a study comparing monks who've done 40,000 hours to monks who've done 60,000 hours and this is, an, this is an amount of meditation you can't even begin to imagine. So this is many, many 12-hour days. And we found their brains changed even between 40,000 hours and 60,000 hours. Wow. Their amygdala kept getting smaller. The stress center of their brain literally withered away. It atrophied. The nucleus accumbens, which handles craving and addiction, part of the reward center, shriveled away. No craving, they didn't want anything, they weren't afraid of anything. So between even 60 and 40,000 hours, we see, see these changes in the brain. So where's the endpoint? How happy can you get? I invite you to try and find out. <laughs> <laughs> How good do you want it? Don't, don't take our word for it. <laughs> uh, no, don't try and find out for yourself. Oh, I love it. I love it, Dawson. You're just amazing. I, I, I just one of those people that just intrigues me and teaches me and I could just listen to you all day. And as a matter of fact, I would definitely want to have you back. I know you've got something big in the works, but for now, how can people get a hold of you? I think you have a gift to give everybody. We'll, we'll put that in the shore notes, but tell everybody what they're, tell everybody what they're going to get, Dave. Well, by all means, go to blissbrain.com and uh, get a copy of the, of the book, Bliss Brain. It's free. You pay shipping and handling, but the book itself is free. And then also in the book, you'll get access to free meditations. And we did a randomized controlled trial of people using those meditations 22 minutes a day, 28 days. Okay, not a big commitment of time, a month, 22 minutes a day. The control group did mindful breathing, the the experimental group did the, the, the method that you'll get in blissbrain.com. And we found in this clinical trial, it's being published actually this month in a medical journal called Innovations in Clinical Neuroscience, peer reviewed journal. And um, we found that in just a month, they had changes in the mid prefrontal cortex, which handles suffering. People who suffer have a lot of activity in the mid prefrontal cortex. That part of the brain went quiet and the insula that handles compassion lit up like a Christmas tree. It was absolutely amazing. And that happened in 28 days, 22 minutes each. So wow. go to thisbrain.com, use those meditations. They literally are changing your brain within the first month and you'll feel super good. You'll start to feel, you'll, you'll unlock levels of happiness that you otherwise wouldn't have found. So just do that one thing. I mean, there's a lot more you'll find through blissbrain.com. I do, I do live classes. I do live blissbrain cl classes. I train practitioners. We have a platform. We have an app called Stress Solution, where we have live practitioners doing one-to-one -one therapy with you in real time on your phone. So we have all wow. kinds of cool th other things as well. But um, just this blissbrain.com, that one thing, and that is a, a high leverage point of everything else going on in your life. So there's a lot more I can talk about. I mean, you have to reduce your stress as well as hit these elevated states you have to do both those things there's a lot more inner work to do but that's a good, a good starting place point. to do start. meditations and yeah. feel how your body feels 
Love that. I love that you give them exact first place to start. So that's perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you for being my friend, Dawson. Thank you for being a, a co light worker with me. Thank you for your brilliance. Thank you for your friendship. And I am very grateful that you came on the Desire Factor podcast today. Uh, I love you, Christy. I love your work. I love you. I love what you're bringing forth into the world right now. And I can't see where you're going to wait to see where you're going to go in the next few years too. love you. Bless you so much. Mm, Me too. Thank you so much.